All right. You know what? There's a stop share button, and I think I could use that with the. Um, it's red. Oh, so it looks like now, a now I see button. a recording button. All right. Let's do that whole thing all over again. Woo! Woohoo! That's what I had to do last time. I had to go back through and record the first five minutes or whatever. Okay. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the Open ABE MOOC Service Learning MOOC. I don't know what we're calling ourselves these days. The Open ABE Service MOOC um, for Instructional Design. Uh, my name is Jennifer Magill, and I'm in Chicago, Illinois. And by the way, tonight is October 27th, for those paying attention. We have a very small group tonight with us, which is great. So we'll be able to jump right into conversations about projects. Um, and with that, I think the only thing I really wanted to do, let me advance my screen real quick here um, with my PowerPoint. Uh, as we always start out thanking everybody for joining us and certainly for the service you're doing for the adult basic education community and just being a cool person by joining the class. Um, but what I really wanted to do is um, get some important dates out there. Um, as everyone knows, the course is uh, drawing near, near to a close. We have a 12-week class that I think we're in week seven. So if um, everybody can pay attention to that December 4th date, I would really appreciate it because pretty much we're gonna shut the lights off. All the facilitators are gonna head to their, uh, their respective corners and start grading papers for the semester. Um, most of our facilitators are um, educators uh, working elsewhere. And so we really do need to shut the class down December 4th. Uh, in terms of our live webinars, uh, as I mentioned, this is our third out of four. So our last one will be Thursday, November 17th, uh, same time, same place, 7 o'clock, and we'll have a, a registration link for you in a couple weeks before that goes live. Um, and then just a quick reminder, I've mentioned it a couple times, but um, many facilitators and participants in the class are going to be at Open Ed 16 next week. It's in Richmond, Virginia. Um, from November 2nd through the 4th. And so if you're going to be there, please reach out and say hi. At last count, there are at least a dozen people associated with this class or the prior installment, either facilitators or students. So we definitely want to use this as an opportunity to say hi face to face. Um, and I mentioned also uh, in every other webinar, we also have coming up on November 12th, a pretty big day. We have a 12 hour webcast-a-thon. And we have 12 invited speakers, as well as other people making cameo appearances. The whole idea is around this idea of educational impact. And each of our speakers will not have PowerPoints. It'll just be a very low-key day, just talking about uh, their passions, what their prior innovations are, things that they're working on um, currently and also into the future. So please sign up for that. It's free. And uh, we hope to see a lot of people there um, for that as well. And then I think... That's about it. I think I just want to stop talking. The only other thing we are going to have tonight in about half an hour, um, I met someone at my AACT conference last week, Jason um, Ninos, and he's an, a, an instructional designer as well as an education, uh, adult education specialist um, with the Arizona Department of Education. And so he's driving home from work right now, and at the bottom of the hour, he plans to join us and um, just give us a little bit of an overview of what he does. He basically does what we're doing in this class. He designs instruction um, for adult basic education and um, other adult education programs. And so I asked him to stick around and, and maybe help us out with some um, suggestions for some of the designers who will be giving us their, their pitch for their design. And with that, I will open the floor to whoever would like to, uh, to start out. Anybody have any questions or want to talk about their projects in general? Go for it. Such a quiet group. Well, I guess I can start. Yay, so, Brittany, go! Everyone's heard me talk anyway. Uh, first time making a, a chat, but uh, lots of time talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you don't know, I live stream. Uh, the work I've done for this course so far. I'm a little behind, but uh, I try to capture it all live. That's great. It's been fun to watch. It's been cool. So. Yeah, so I think my current pitch would be um, what comprehension based on 
what is applicable in real life for these learners. And so um, maybe a bit of group work and some scenarios to recognize skills they already have that are applicable on how their um, comprehension is. Oh, okay. And so it'd be something that they would be reading, some type of like um, reading material or something like that? Yeah, that's the current plan, some sort of reading material. Um, yeah. That's why I need to work on this week, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I don't know if um, you've had a chance to follow around along. Um, there's been some really good um, suggestions on reading material. Um, I think Andrew mentioned he likes to always incorporate something from current events. And so, what I, if, of course, right now it escapes. Is it Newzella or something like that, where you can find the current news articles, but um, at, at an appropriate grade um, level for what you're trying to, you know, what, what you're targeting? Um, have you seen that site? If I'm even I've it. heard of it. Um, I don't know if that's the name either, but it sounds really useful. Is that right? Did you, does anyone know what I'm talking about? And everybody can open their mic, by the way. We only have eight people here, so this is kind of nice. We can just all chit-chat tonight. We don't have to worry about. I'm just going to see if I can find that post you uh, mentioned. Yeah, what is it called? Is it called Newsella? And so, Brittany, what were your ideas then as far as, like, kind of take us through what the um, experience was like, like, kind of from when they sit down to when they walk out, maybe we can start brainstorming as a group some ideas on how you could take them through the, and I, I'm assuming you're talking like a face-to-face -face class? Yeah, a face-to-face. Um, sorry, I'm not feeling super great tonight, so I'm a little scattered. But uh, probably come in and... I want it to be mostly independent um, of an instructor, if mm -hmm. possible, just because I think part of adult learners is a non-traditional schooling system is uh, better for them, like they're, they've already left a traditional education system. And so I want them to feel capable of addressing this and what they can do. Um, so maybe come in and have a little bit of um, guidelines from an instructor and a couple of different types of readings that they can go through and pick out and be like, these are what I think are the most important aspects of this. And then what I recognize are important. Um, and the key points and the, what I need to do from this, the, the takeaways kind of thing. And then get in a group with other members that might be there and say, what did you take from this? And this is why I took this from this. Um, so it's not just straight like, yes, you're right or wrong, but this is the rationale kind of thing. Right. No, I think that's great. And I, uh, as you're speaking, I looked online. I'm 99.9% .9 sure this is the correct one. However, um, I'm having trouble right now. Um, I think this is also where you can search then by... Um, and if it's not, I will definitely put it in the um, in the course under resources if, I, if I'm on the wrong site, uh, where you can have it adjusted to the um, to the reading level of the learner. But I think it would be really cool. And you know, certainly the one that comes to mind right now is the election. Obviously, that will be over shortly. But even just you know some of the topical things that came up around the election and some of the things that are, are in the news, and that's what's kind of neat about using an article like that this because if people hear about it on TV or in the radio and they drive into their car and so on, the whole idea of activation which is so important as part of the lesson when you start out they're like oh yeah I heard that or you know have an opinion I guess that's that's another way to think of it too is that they've heard it as well as then maybe have an opinion at, from the get-go so it's not like you have to kind of give about a lot of backstory to what the issue is or what it is that they're, they're talking about um, absolutely does anybody else on the panel um, want to chime in and, and give some suggestions on, um, on some sources for materials? Because certainly we talk about this a lot in module three, finding open educational resources that you can use as, the, as your instructional materials. I don't know, um, JR, you're a good person to, to ping on this one. Any thoughts on, on other sources where she could maybe go to find resources? Uh, for reading comprehension, I, I've been in the world of images a lot lately, so I've been uh, pinging the Search Creative Commons and also one called Solvenauts, which is uh, a meta search engine that scans websites and then anything that just has like a typical uh, 
copyright license, it gets rid of that just like the Search Creative Commons uh, one does. Um, I don't often end up looking for strictly reading materials, but things like the current event sites um, come to mind. So that's just where I'm at right now. Another um, thing I have recommended in the past is um, if there is a particular issue you're interested in, say you're working with one of the learners who's in a rural community and maybe a farming issue, sometimes if you go to the, either the state or nonprofits, um, for example, one that comes to mind um, is like pesticide use or something, you know, something like that, you may be able to have better luck on a nonprofit website um, where they have, um, they're, you know, more likely to have it Creative Commons versus purely copyrighted, and same with like state government um, publications. The only thing there you need to probably worry about a little bit is reading level, um, but it's just another opportunity to try to find. That was a big problem last semester, people trying to find um, reference material for the type of project you're working on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I don't know, if, can you hear me okay? This is John. Hey John, yeah. Hey. Hey. Sorry to butt in there. I got, was a little bit late with the time and all. Um, I had a, well, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this yet or not. I found recently uh, one good option for finding um, OER materials is uh, the Google Advanced Search. And uh, not only with uh, images and multimedia, but if you, you do the um, um, share, share alike, the, the lower level where you get more materials, uh, you can really clue, uh, you can zero in on very particular things, searching not only images, but just the web search. So it gives you um, all kinds of government resources, everything, public domain, and so on. And I found that it's just growing. I've been using it for when it, when it first came out. I don't know if it's been seven, eight years. And it's getting pretty powerful now. And you can find courses uh, where you have to dig in a little. There's, it's, there's a lot of curating and digging. But uh, I found that uh, really um, something to explore. Oh, thank so you for that. Tool. That's great. Yeah, and somebody mentioned in the course this week, like you're saying, digging, even if it points you to the site, um, sometimes it's like a link to a link, you know? And so you have to kind of go back to the source to see what you're, um, what you're finding and looking like the terms of, ser um, terms of use or terms of service. Uh, but like you said, the, that's a great, a great first start when you're try trying to dig through it. Um, anybody else have any um, thoughts about Brittany's, um, how she could run the exercise or run the, the lesson or find materials? Um, I have something that I did with a class. I'm not sure if it would work for you, Brittany, but maybe a version of it would. I took, um, these were teenagers, and so I found a story in uh, online that was about downloading music and you could use any topic but basically this had the point of view of the they had to read it in three different groups that's the point of view of the um musician of the people who are downloading and then the other point of view was like the music producers and so they got into three different groups which were those groups they read it and they kind of had to come up with reasons why their group felt like it was a positive or a negative to have these free downloads like how did it help them or hurt them and in the story a lady had a huge fine I can't remember what the fine was but it was a giant fine for downloading well for stealing music and so this opened up the door to talk about things like copyright and just some of the things that people don't think about whenever they're just you know, I mean, that's kind of a common thing for people to think they can just download anything because it's on the internet. And we kind of had a little mock debate. It wasn't a true debate, but they got to kind of have their, come up with their points from their reading and respond to each other. And it helped them to see different sides of things because, of course, teenagers were on the side of we should all get free music just because we should get free music. Because <laughs> it's on the internet, right? Exactly. And it's there. and We should get it. And why wouldn't they give it away? But when they were the one that had to make a living off of it, they had a little different story. They didn't really think they should give it away. <laughs> oh, that's so. cool. So I missed that part. So you had each of the groups take on kind of a role then? Right. Oh, so okay, cool. one group was people downloading and for are taking the music downloading and one group was music producers so they kind of had 
and I did give them prep, you know, like we talked about what would a music producer do, like what types of things, you know, they're putting on concerts, they're having to run a studio, all of these types of things. And then the artist, what do they have to do and how do they make their money? And so then they each group had one of those three personas to be and had, and then we had a little debate from that. That's awesome. And where do you teach? Uh, at that time I was with Washington state university right now. I'm just finishing a master's and in, in education and getting another job one day. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, did you have anything else, Brittany, any questions or any, I mean, like you said, you're kind of just getting into it right now yourself, but yeah. Um, I love the top of my head. Um, of course, as always, if you watch my streams, feedback is great. <laughs> if you want to comment there, that, that would be awesome. Um, I go back and rewatch them a lot to try and catch myself back up on where I am. So um, that's good. <laughs> and actually, this is a perfect reminder um, of where we are in the class. We, um, you know, again, it's kind of a, a, a curve as far as like how people <laughs> make it through each module. We get you know, leaders and stragglers and whatever and a bunch in the middle. So most of the people right now are working their way um, starting in module four. And so it might be a good time to take it. I don't know if you've gotten to that point yet, but um, that's where we introduce the design guide. And so it's the point where you take it, all these ideas swirling in your head and then start to lay it out in, in written form. And then it also gives us a chance as we're within the discussion form. The idea is it's a design showcase. And so even though it's, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's very much of a, a draft or a proposal or a plan. Um, but once you kind of start laying out an outline, sequencing things, kind of like we were talking about, like introducing the activation, like how are you going to introduce the topic and how are you going to get people in groups or whatever it may be. Um, it really helps then when you showcase because then people can offer you, you know, feedback just from what you've written as well. So um, that's not just you. That's to everybody that's on, on right now. That's what you should um, – kind of expect to see in module four. That's the whole purpose. So there's no new introduced, new material introduced in module four. It's more just, here's our, here's our game plan for how we're going to start um, drafting our, our documents. So Brittany, I like that you do your live stream. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. I've, been, I've watched every once in a while and I think it's a really cool thing that you're doing. How does that work for you as far as um, you're organizing your thoughts and cutting brainstorming? It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. It's it's very different thinking out loud than it is not. Um, usually, when I design, I, I get very like in my own head and I doodle stuff out for all over and make a giant mess. Um, <laughs> and with this, I'm really trying to like narrate everything I'm doing and and say everything I'm thinking. And I catch myself like stopping and being like, wait, where am I going with this? <laughs> oh, I think it's a awesome. Lot. I think it's awesome. And Jay, but I like it. Oh, go, go ahead, please go ahead. Oh, I just, I, I'm finding it's really useful. Uh, I have some health issues and, and I've had a lot of difficulty lately with keeping up with higher level cognition. And so I rewatching them has been really helpful for me. Oh, that's true too. Cause they're recorded, right? To go yeah. back and yeah. I find that even just with our webcast too, where it's like, I, I always go back through and edit it and I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even remember I said that. <laughs> it's like when you hear yourself, you're like, oh yeah, that's right. Brittany, you might want to think about incorporating that into one of your, le into a lesson. I mean, that is a great way for someone to give feedback on what they've had to read or any, you know, if you're doing a reading, that's if you're doing idea. literacy type stuff, producing something like what you're doing on Twitter is still showing that you, that you understand it. And it's just a new way of showing that you understand it compared to just writing it down. So, and there's so many free tools out there for doing, you know, video, even if it was something private to stay in a class, you know? Absolutely. And oh yeah. I use free with stuff. Stu with students with, um, on their phones, you know, everybody, yeah. everybody mm -hmm. can just sit and turn on the, you know, the recording and video themselves. Yeah, if I was if I was going to jam on that one, then like it doesn't even have to be a video necessarily. The, right. um, in 
in K-12, they do lots of examples with reading comprehension where they're either just reading through, um, say, like a book chapter or something, and then they have to listen back. And it's like whatever they end up handing in, like they've re-recorded and re-recorded because they don't like the way that it sounds. But I could see where, you know, in this context, if they're reading something about a current event, then they can like read it and then provide some some opinion or some feedback yeah. around like, um, you know, the, the key points in the article or um, what decision they might make going forward if, if there's kind of a question at the end of it. Yeah, and you think about adults have seen newscasts and listened to radio, and they're a lot more familiar with giving feedback on a point in some ways, you know, than the kids may be. So that that could be a great way to do it. Yeah, it really really take good, it yeah. to the next level. Yeah. Thanks. I think, I'm curious as long as we have everybody on, uh, how are you finding, uh, first of all, if you want to respond, how have you, what's your experience working with adults, um, like for adult basic education or adult secondary education? And then if you don't have any experience, how does that compare to the other audiences you've ever designed for or taught? Just kind of curious throwing that out there. Oh, for each of us, just to answer. Yeah, I'm just kind oh, of curious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've caught I've, my background is mostly with um, K-12, and I have done uh, a lot of adult stuff more like train the trainer to work with K-12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of experiential education to incorporate that into um, learning, so train the trainer to do those types of things in the classroom. And um, I really like both. It's not, I mean, there's pros and cons to both, but, um, it's a lot of fun. You get to be really creative with and with the youth, but um, with the adults, you can go so much further than you can. But they're not always as open to fun. Always, oh, <laughs> they're not as always open to fun and different. They just sometimes want to know what they're supposed to do and give feedback. And so that sometimes is hard to drag. It's harder to drag it out of adults, I think, than it is to get kids interested in doing something different. <laughs> wow, that's a really cool perspective. That's really, cause, yeah, because we keep harping on this idea that they have life experiences, but to your point, if they won't share them, then <laughs> right. which is a good thing to think about um, building in, because of course, this is going to be someone that has this class for a little bit of time. So they would be able to, they're going to develop some sort of relationship with them. But of course, you know, like on the first day, they're not, they may or may not know these people and they may or may not participate. And you have, you know, as an instructor, you have to be prepared for, well, what will I do then? <laughs> Cause you can't force people to talk, of course, but so, and building in some icebreaker activities to kind of slowly get into what you're doing, I think works a lot with all the age groups. All right. That's great. Anybody else have any thoughts? Okay, or we got so many Jennifers. I can just say Jennifer in like half of the room. <laughs> We're all probably in the same decade, too. <laughs> Popular name. Yeah, anybody else have any thoughts on, on anything? If you want to comment on Brittany's, or if you want to share your own, or just give your perspective on working with adults, whatever. Open mic tonight, whatever you're interested in talking about. I do work with adults. Um, in a training capacity, I train our new associate faculty. Okay. Um, I I've found the ones with PhDs are a little bit harder to <laughs> to uh, deal with. Um, you know, in the training, we just want an answer. We don't want a dissertation. We don't <laughs> <laughs> like look at the material, answer the question, move it along. <laughs> The opposite um, of their life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just simple, get through it. Um, but it's been fun. I like, I personally, I like working with adults more than I would mm -hmm. K-12. Um, I, I probably have a little less tolerance, just I notice they don't read a lot, like directions. And, <laughs> and, and you know, in my mind, I'm thinking you're a grown-ass adult, read the direction. <laughs> but um, but I, it, it's rewarding when they, um, you know, we, we coach them on positive feedback and um, being available for students, things like that. And when, it, when they 
reflect on their responses that they give us and redo it, it's really great to see them um, make that connection and see how that impacts the students. So it is, I like, yeah. So what are you I, heard, I actually heard you met one of my friends at the uh, AECT last I week. I did, who's that? And she's going to be helping out, Deb Slaughter. Deb Slaughter, could be, I'm so sorry. I know. <laughs> I know. We had a booth and it was wonderful because we had everybody answer that, you know, what impact will you make question. Mm -hmm. And then to your point, it was really funny. PhDs were like, they did, they cited research in theory. And I'm like, no, 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 this is like from your heart. What is it? <laughs> we can't help it. <laughs> okay, so Deb Slaughter, okay. Oh, I do know who that is. Okay, did she make me cry potentially? Does this ring a bell? Does she, oh. is she from Michigan? Yes. Yeah, she did make me cry. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, in a good way. Why am I crying about it now? Because she didn't. She dropped out of high school, right? Yes. She dropped out of high school, and now she went on to pursue her PhD, right? She has her yeah, her doctorate. Yeah, she does. So cool. yeah, she has reached out. She's she was amazing. So we she was just walking. She was just walking between hallway, you know, rooms, and she just like something caught her eye on our booth, and then she came over, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, this is my life story." <laughs> this is what yeah. I started out as. Um, you know, the learner, and now here I'm, you know, I, I would be designing the instruction. So, that's mm -hmm. awesome. mm -hmm. so do you have any, um, any comments on the project you're working on for this class? Well, it's actually funny because the other two Jennifers that are on are in my group. Oh, you guys are in a group. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just one of our members isn't here. Oh, um, cool. Well, yeah, go ahead. Tell us what you're doing. So we wanted to do something with like financial literacy, and we were gearing towards maybe couponing. Oh, cool. Okay. And doing um, something, a uh, lesson around that. Um, I know the other one, Jennifer, can't talk. She's in a place where she can't talk, but she's listening and taking notes. Um, I don't know if you, Jennifer, want to say anything about that. Well, um, Ruth had some great ideas about using the couponing um, and coming up with like a budget so that they're having to practice. Like if you're looking at an ad for, um, you know, sales at a grocery store, even just reading that, comprehending it, trying to figure out, do you have a better buy with just looking at the sale flyer versus using coupons and having some different scenarios along with that. So it's a lot of, a lot of comprehension and for reading and um, a lot of different possibilities for math. That's really cool. You know what? Our guest is here, so maybe I'll put him on the spot. Hey, Jason, Actually, can you can can I just jump in there for a second? Sure, yeah, please. Um, Go ahead. With math, with math lessons like that too, like even just introductory, like the uh, the infamous like which tube of toothpaste is actually better to, to buy, and like I even myself, I stand in the store sometimes. <laughs> Wait, which one is the better? Thank one? God for the unit price, so, right? Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. the units aren't always the same. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> so yeah, things like like I think it, it has a perfect opportunity for scaffolding mm -hmm. in there yeah. and different scenarios. Yeah, the uh, so hi, my name is Jason Yos. <laughs> We're gonna throw you right into the fire, Jason. <laughs> That's fine. I'm used to it. So, um, so if Jenner hasn't talked about myself, I am an educational technologist for the Arizona Department of Education, and I work with uh, teachers throughout the state of Arizona about incorporating technology into their curriculum. Uh, into their teaching practices. Um, and so, you know, the comment on what Jennifer Johnson was just talking about with the part I caught with uh, using the shopping, the shopping ads for a math lesson, you know, to me is a great, is great. Uh, Cause that's one of the things that we would, you know, I would look at in regards to that's using authentic materials and things that we really encourage our teachers to, uh, with our teachers to do because it really it connects it to authentic uh, learning opportunities and, you know, really gets back to the idea of the, co what common core um, tasks are supposed to be like. Um, so and then my, instantaneously thought on that would be, okay, we well, can use regular circular ads or we can use online ads mm -hmm. to uh, get them into the digital sphere. Um, Cause the way I would relate to that is every week my wife puts out a uh, email blast to people in our church on what's on sale for that week. 
and involves her going through each ad and she does it digitally going through the store. It's going through the common stores on our area and posting what's the good deals for the week. And Ruth so, does something similar and that was part of what, or she came up with the idea for us to start kind of building upon because Ruth does the Yeah. Yeah, I use actually um, a website called Living Rich with Coupons, uh -huh. and it matches the store and then tells you coupons that you can get and what circular it's in, so you can add that to it, and oh, any uh, store coupons that you can use as well, like the digital e-coupons. Yeah, yep. So, so yeah, those would be uh, great lesson ideas for working with, um, you know, your adult, your adult basic education, because like I said, it's an everyday task that can easily be tied into mathematical lessons. So, and so, um, you know, I met Jennifer recently at a conference, uh, Jennifer Madrell, so, <laughs> at, a, at a conference uh, recently, and, you know, she told me about her MOOC, and I was really excited with what you guys were doing and started looking at uh, the materials that, um, I don't know if it was previous MOOCs have put mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the OER Commons, um, and then started sharing that with people I work with because I thought that was just uh, fabulous, so. Oh, that's um, amazing. Yeah, tell me. Okay, this is cool, because we don't, we don't know. We just put it out in the universe, so we have no idea. Yeah. Happening. And so what I do, I guess as an educational technologist, I put on webinars or trainings uh, with um, trainers that we have at each individual site. So how adult education works in Arizona is we have uh, 24 state funded programs. Um, so we get our money from the federal government, we get money from the state government, and then we disperse that money to programs that have put in for applications to be an adult basic uh, program, adult education program throughout the state. Uh, not that there's, so there are other adult programs in the state that don't get funded to, from us that offer GED prep and everything like that, but we work with programs that are specifically funded by us. And so I do trainings with them. I go out and do site visits to say, you know, to do teacher observations and say, hey, this is what you're doing. This is how you can incorporate some of the technology into your, uh, into your teaching practices. And so, uh, you know, I try to put out an email blast every Monday talking about, you know, up tra upcoming trainings I'm doing, resources they can access and stuff like that, which they then, the trainers should then share with their, um, you know, coworkers and colleagues. And so I, you know, came in on, Tuesday because I was out sick on Monday and put out a blast to the trainers saying hey if you haven't looked at this there's a uh, 501c 3c that call, called designers for learning it's a MOOC for instructional designers where they sit and design lesson plans for adult basic education and then linked it to your guys's MOOC and then listen, linked it to the specific uh, OER commons for that you guys uh, have submitted so oh, thank you great. Our teachers will be appreciated of that. Oh my gosh, that's great! That's that's the whole that's the deal. So that's awesome. yeah. And I don't. And then before you joined us, I wanted to make sure we circle back to some um, uh, a, a lesson we talked about with Brittany. Um, she's doing a comprehension lesson, um, and we were the question came up um, like finding source material that um, to use. Do you have any recommendations on either websites or places you go to get? Um, Creative Commons licensed um, material at, at various grade levels? Not off the top of my head. I would have to look into that. Um, you know, usually my first place to go is OER Commons. Um, other things would be readwritethink.org would be another place to find um, material uh, materials for it. Um, and then our, we have curriculum. Well, most of the time programs will buy curriculum that is um, tied to their uh, to the Arizona State standards so they'll utilize curriculum with that so it's kind of a hodgepodge of different things that can that can be utilized so as far as specific examples um, that one like I said I would probably just my first thing would be searching the OER comments for any kind of material and then um, using utilizing just do a search for open educational resources for reading materials. So yeah, and that's what John mentioned. The you know going to Google and you know making the proper selection for the you know the license selection. Yeah, absolutely. So sorry, I don't have any super illuminating <laughs> ideas on that one. Sometimes I do it just like you guys would do it. <laughs> so did, did that group, uh, the Jennifers and Ray? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Did you guys have any um, specific questions uh, for Jason or for the group as far as like how you're planning on sequencing the lesson or any anything in particular you wanted to to drill down on? 
questions for me or que they have questions for them? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Questions for the group. As long as you're here to help answer them, yeah. that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and everybody else. I don't have anything right now. <laughs> I might before the end. Who knows? <laughs> something someone says to me spark something. Okay. So, um, so okay. can I share some a little more information with you guys real fast? Definitely. Please do. Yeah, we want to hear it. Yep. So, um, one of the things that I encourage you guys to think about um, is start at possibly looking at your lessons and how they can be adapted to hybrid hybrid learning. Um, that's one of the things we really push. Uh, we're starting to push for more of in Arizona. And granted, we are on the uh, forefront in this modality of trying to utilize more hybrid lessons. But it's something to think about as you guys start um, thinking about your designing your lessons. Um, I can give you some quick numbers to show you uh, to talk about um, the enrollment in Arizona and let me find my numbers I apologize because I copied the wrong slide <laughs> and just to clarify so we're saying the same thing so hybrid meaning that they do attend the face-to-face -face site but they are util while they're there they're utilizing some degree of online or computer-based instruction <laughs> Not necessarily why they're there, but at some point they can util they can utilize instruction that is outside the classroom, whether okay, it's a, so a learning be. management system or digital, um, a digital repository that teachers utilize themselves. We have um, a couple different teachers who utilize like Google Sites and just do a website that they can they post materials that their students can have access to uh, at any point. So not necessarily um, using not necessarily just confined to the classes, the, uh, the confines of the classroom, but getting them utilizing stuff outside the classroom too. Okay. And what assumptions do you make as you're pulling up your stuff? Um, what kind of assumptions do you make as far as their access to computers and quality internet? Um, we make pretty standard assumptions just because while they might not have computers, uh, if they don't have computers at home, um, some most programs will have computer labs open that they can utilize okay. or we always encourage you have public libraries that you can utilize even in some of our more, more rural um, places there's public libraries that they can utilize and so we encourage that um, to you know encourage the instructors to utilize have their students utilize that too so to give you some ideas of uh, what I'm talking about in our numbers um, so last year um, we had a break, uh, breakdown of almost 8,000 traditional learners, and this is uh, just fine as learners who got uh, instruction just in a classroom. That's, that's it. We had 776 distance learners, and that's federally defined as anybody who's gotten instruction um, where 50% of their instruction is outside the classroom through um, online uh, distance learning. So it doesn't mean that they're pure distance learner, but their learners have done, they, they've gotten more, accumulated more hours outside the classroom on digital platforms that they have inside the classroom. And then lastly, we had 4,700 uh, students who got instruction and in what uh, at that point has been termed hybrid, who've gotten some instruction outside the classroom, but less than 50% of their uh, instruction outside the classroom. Okay. That's awesome. And so, and yeah, we're encouraging this because we're showing in our numbers, we're getting students who get more educational gains, which is what's been termed as they're moving up in, um, in basic education level through um, uh, when they utilize hybrid, uh, hybrid instruction. So um, in Arizona, we use the TAVE placement and Class E for our placement uh, testing to see where our students are at when they enter our program. And then educational gain is measured when they get, when they move up a level on those assessments. And we're showing that we get better, we get better um, educational gains if, you know, instruction is being uh, utilized as that hybrid model. Okay. And then TAVE is what, a uh, test of adult basic education? Basic education, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then Class E, sorry, I'm using, I'm throwing out jargon that not everybody might know. <laughs> and then Class E is for your English language learners. Um, that's their version of TAPE. Okay. So would you say um, how many of the students then that you're talking about here are pursuing a GED or would they be, what, what other types of um, outcomes would they potentially be you know, going for? 
Well, and that's one thing you have to be careful of um, with the recent introduction of WIOA, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. The measurement for success is going to be changing, especially uh, in the coming fiscal year. So um, it's, a, it's being, you know, we're in that transition year um, now, but coming in the next fiscal year, which starts in July, uh, measurement is going to be less about um, GED attainment and more on uh, post-secondary uh, movement. Okay. And so while, you know, it's, it's always looked, you know, in the past it's always been looked at getting their GED and that's being the most important thing. We're starting to get more focused on what are they going to do after they get their GED? So they need to, you know, are they going to, you know, a trade school or getting a, a recognized certificate or are they enrolling in post-secondary education? And so that is starting to become the new measurement of, of uh, a adult basic education success of what they're doing, what are they doing after they're done with your program? Okay. So we're, you know, we run it, we, that's why like the lesson that we talked about before uh, that, it, that was to being talked about when I came in um, is another great thing because it's really utilizing um tasks that could be transferable, you know, analyzing information, you know, things that are going to be, that they're going to be the transfer as they move outside of the classroom and into the workforce. And so that's one thing I would encourage you guys to keep in mind as you, as you uh, work on your lessons is think about how, what skills are they getting out of this lesson that can be transferred to task force? Because, you know, GED attainment is important, but as programs move into WIOA, um, it's going to be, they're going to be measured on Post, you know, what their students doing after they get their GED. So those are like the career pathways then? Is that yeah. like the, uh, and then we've, in our class, we've, we've um, a lot, um, shared, obviously we've got the co um, college and career readiness, which are aligned with the common core, which most yep. think if they're like the academic standards. Yeah. And then we're also looking like employability skills. And I, it escapes me on who is behind that, uh, but it, it lays out, um, like some of the career clusters and some of the, and the skills. Uh, I think that would be Octave. Yeah, I think it is. I think. Yeah. Do you use things like, do your teachers use things like that as far as trying to um, determine the skills that are needed for different careers? Um, our teachers don't utilize that, but I would imagine that's going to be phased in more as we um, adapt to WIOA, because that's one of the things that as a state level, as, as state leadership, we're working on more too, is a unified workforce plan to adapt to that kind of thinking in our, um, at state leadership level, and then, you know, hopefully to trickle down to our um, educators too, of, you know, thinking about how the, you know, what these skills will transfer into career clusters. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So please, let's, uh, let's open it to everybody to either Pitch your, pitch your, uh, your design or ask questions about your design or ask questions um, uh, of, 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 in general. Of, in general. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for filling in the blank there. <laughs> yes, I, I had a couple questions there for Jason or along that line. Um, can you hear me okay? Just to yep. make sure. Yep. yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Sure. Um, what we're doing, I'm right now, I'm situated in a, um, uh, it's a, a four year college. So I'm, I'm coming from that vantage point right now. Recently, I've worked in uh, uh, literacy volunteers, worked with adult ed, but this is more, you know, formalized, basically. But um, we're dealing with a lot of um, a competency based education now. So looking at skills like um, I've seen some, I'm not familiar with the ones you just mentioned, but uh, we're coming up with clusters of competencies. Uh, uh, SNU is doing this, other New Hampshire. Uh, it's pretty popular now. And um, there's a 21st century um, competencies that are set up. Uh, that's, that's pretty handy to have uh, some standards that have already been validated. I don't know if, uh, I guess if you've mentioned any, you said you're talking about it. Uh, we also have stackable credentials is another thing, so that people are really being trained not, not to get this degree necessarily, but to get trained to be able to do a job, to have the necessary skills. And it seems like there's, uh, there's definitely a parallel movement there. So, um, yeah, that's the question. Um, so we're revising our standards at the moment, and we um, currently in Arizona, we have our standards, you know, generally based on your content standards. So your English, uh, English 
you know, math, science, you know, generally those standards. Um, as far as company-based standards, I'm not sure if they're going to be in our uh, newest revision. Uh, but one of the things you talked about is you know, one of the things I can connect it to is um, you kind of similar to IBES training is what I think of when you're talking about your company-based standards. Um, and IBES isn't throughout Arizona, but there's different programs that offer training, that offer parallel training in a uh, field along with students getting their GED um, education. And so basically how that's set up is um, programs are encouraged to look at the job market and find programs that are, uh, find job opportunities for their uh, students uh, in job fields that are in need in their area. So one area might have construction, one area might have nursing, um, and I can think of like a couple, uh, there's a couple of programs in Phoenix who do, who have an IBES program centered around nursing, uh, physician's assistants. And so while they're going to class, uh, they're getting team taught and they're getting team taught by a content teacher and then they're getting taught by a uh, professional in that, um, in that program, in that career cluster. So in this case, someone in, you know, from the nursing field. And so all their content material is, uh, all their material is circled around working in that uh, career cluster once they leave the, um, the, the, uh, the GED program and incorporating those uh, credentials into, uh, and getting that, getting those credentials into their program also. So um, that's something that you're, um, excuse me, that your college might look at is IBES, and that was originally modeled in Washington State on how they, how they work, uh, look at and run their programs. That's great. Great, yeah, that uh, that's, uh, seems to be right uh, along the same line, definitely. And um, I mean, it is valuable. You think about um, in the future, people changing careers. I mean, we're not only talking about adult ed, and there may be a lot of displaced workers that, that are being retrained and so on. And yeah. you have a number of credentials that can already be validated, but you might be missing uh, the content, for example, right? That yeah. might be it. Yeah. So you have the skills, necessary skills, but not the content. Sometimes you may have the content, but not the skills. So you can be able to swap them back. So yeah, these IBEST programs are really focused on on people who might like both of those. Yeah, you know, not necessarily working with displaced workers, but just working okay. with those with those um you know who left traditional schooling uh, before they were able to attain their high school diploma, and then working on with them to get their you know their G, their HSC uh, is what we actually try to call it in Arizona their high school equivalency diploma, um, and um, coupling that with credentialing in a field. Oh, that's so interesting. So yeah, let, let, let's kind of circle back in some of the acronyms just because it, you know, we're all trying to learn them. Yep. So, so you use HED, which is high school equivalency. Well, and the reason why we say that is because GED is actually a registered trademark. Okay, and got it. That's a specific test. Uh -huh. um, we HSC is your is your generic term for that uh, high school equivalency, because Ar while Arizona recognizes the GED and that's our um, test of choice. Uh, other states will use um, other testing in order to validate an HSC, the high school equivalency. And so some states use, I think one's called TASC is one. Mm -hmm. some, day, okay. some states use uh, high set. Yep, that's the other one. Some states use portfolios. And so, you know, we try not to use GED because that's, the, you know, the right. you know, specific. It's like using Kleenex and tissue. Okay. Kleenex right. is your, is your uh, specific brand. Tissue is your, is your generic. And then the other acronym, um, I think I think it's an acronym. You said the I best. Is that it? Uh, is that an acronym? Yeah. Or? Um, yes. And don't ask me what it stands for. <laughs> That's I cannot remember. <laughs> um, but I'll have to no. Google that. So those are those are like. Um, it lays out. I'm, I'm going to use the word standards. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it lays out. Like so it, it lays out a program, a, a program, and I'm putting a link into the chat box that links to Washington State, who is the model for IBES. Uh, basically, IBES is a it's a training method to where, like I said, they're they're getting their high school equivalency along with getting credentialing in a field, and it all depends. You know, we in Arizona we encourage local programs to look at the job market in their area to develop an IBIS program to, um, to train and whether they're going to have uh, vacancies because 
you don't want to have an IBEST program in an area where they're going to get trained in nursing, but they don't have a nursing shortage okay. because then they're, they're not going to get placed anywhere. Whereas, you know, in Phoenix, we have a large, uh, you know, geriatric population. So physician assistance is a, is a good, or dental hygienist is a good, um, cause that's another one that's being offered is a good field for to get that training in because, um, that's, uh, there's a field for that. There's a need for those people in that, in this area. Okay. Yes. Right. Thank you, John. Integrated basic education and yeah, skills training. Thank you for that. That's perfect. As you were just talking about the, the different equivalencies for Kleenex and tissue, you mentioned like you just kind of glossed over portfolios. I'm wondering if you could actually talk about um, looking at portfolios a little bit more. No. no? <laughs> um, and the only reason I can't is just because I'm, um, I'm, Rel I won't say relatively new. I've been in my current position for a year with the Arizona Department of Education, but before that I had a very limited knowledge of adult education and how it worked, especially in Arizona before that. And with Arizona not being a portfolio state, I don't have any knowledge on how those portfolios are assessed for uh, uh, HSC attainment. So okay. I'm not going to try to wax poetically on something. <laughs> yeah, no, that's... I have no problem admitting I don't know. I appreciate the honesty. Yes. <laughs> um, I just know one of our participants uh, was tossing around some ideas about po the possibility of portfolios. And so, yeah. uh, and, it, and it's something that we're that. actually looking at right now of expanding uh, acceptable equivalency, acceptable equivalencies to get your high school, you know, get your HSC. Um, we're looking at possibly expanding outside of just the GED, mm -hmm. but that's just in exploratory phases at the moment. So like I said, unfortunately, I just don't have any knowledge of what uh, a portfolio would look like in that case. That's awesome. Um, that'd be cool. That'd be cool to see that, uh, that happening. Um, and then we've got Mary, and I'm kind of going through the list here, who maybe we didn't get a chance to say, uh, and Kay, did you, either of you want to either talk about your designs or ask any questions of Jason or of any of us? Um, I was kind of wondering whether what I was working on is realistic. <laughs> Yeah, um, I have no background in education other than some corporate training and then um, I have worked with the homeless population in um, over a few years doing um, relaxation and um, and yoga so it's a different <laughs> and so now I'm doing my master's in instructional design and um, this is my second um, take at this MOOC. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I had thought about for farming communities, um, you know, drones are being used mm -hmm. more and more. And I had wondered about maybe doing something where you um, could scaffold the um, students working through um, a piece about drones and whether that would be applicable to a particular scenario. So would the scenario that would be presented um, be reasonably solved by purchasing a drone. So then I thought maybe having um, questions that they would have to go to the text and pull out information like how much or, you know, scope or something. And anyway, fill in that information as they go and then it gets at the end put together into like a paragraph or two paragraphs that summarizes and then they could end with their opinion as to what they um, think. Um. I wouldn't be opposed to that. The, my only my only caveat would be make sure uh, you might want to scaffold uh, understanding what a drone is uh, yeah. in regards. Um, yeah, you know, as long as you're not trying to actually utilize a drone, awesome. Because <laughs> I will tell you, adult education does not get funded as it should be, as long as, as, long as every part of education, but especially adult education. And so uh, I will always utilize. You know, I will I would emphasize free, free, free and free in regards to when you're thinking about designing these lessons. Um, yeah. So, you know, especially if it's a farming community, if you're, you know, targeting that kind of um, um, place and the utilization of, of drones, because, yeah, that is happening out in the regular world. I don't think you should have a problem with it, especially because you're, you're looking at text-dependent questions um, and, up, uh, and then having them apply that to uh, – uh, critical thinking of how that could be utilized. And so I think that's a, I think that's a great idea. Like I said, my, my only thing is just 
scaffold it with an under, you know, with something that they can help help them understand drone, just in case you have somebody who doesn't have that understanding. Um, yeah, I would, I, one of the things that um, I had thought was, you know, if you're if in a group situation that they, that prior knowledge could be activated by a general discussion of what they know about farmers and issues like that and then also the teacher could introduce the drone which everyone kind of has heard of drones but maybe they don't know what drones do for farms which is actually really interesting and there's tons of uh, YouTube videos and there's also lots of um, advertising materials from companies who sell it which, yeah so um, what my wondering was uh, using material that's um, you know not copyrighted and then also writing something that is appropriate for the grade level which in my case would be about eighth grade mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm thinking maybe i need to write that or to pull together information from different sources and either create something that's i don't know whether to use like actual ads um or whether to use a narrative that i've created um, either okay. one is uh, the only the only hesitancy i would have with uh actual ads is just copyright um because like i said the point of this is to be posted into the oer commons and so i would be hesitant about uh utilizing actual ads so i mean maybe you can utilize you know maybe you can do a mock-up of an ad or something like that uh that's free of copyright um but otherwise yeah i like that idea especially because it's it is you know real world applicable um especially in regards to, you know, looking at, looking at the information and then having that discussion on how it might be utilized. So I would say either one is great, uh, a narrative or an ad, or you might want to include both because you might, uh, that can go into your differentiated instruction for your, you know, really struggling readers. You can incorporate the, uh, the ad that has more visuals and less text. And then for those readers, even though it's targeted eighth grade, you still, you know, in adult education classroom, you're going to have people who are going to be wide on the spectrum in regards to their reading ability um, because unlike in k-12 you don't really get a nice you know layout of okay you know this person can read at this level this person can read at this level so they're going to be in two different classes uh in a generally an adult education cl classroom it's okay we have a class in english at this time can you come awesome so everyone gets thrown in that class together so having those having both of those um, I know it would be a little bit of work on you, a little more, more, more work on you, but it would be beneficial for that differentiating, differing, differing that instruction. Okay. Cool. Um, I think for your beginning piece of it, if you think about some specific problems in farming that are related to how the drone is used, and maybe your scenarios or I mean, you can create some scenarios and kind of let them come up with ideas of how they think a drone could be used and then you can also then pre present your real solutions how they really are being used after you kind of get feedback from them but if you just come up with some scenarios that way I think you wouldn't have to worry about copyright as much and then do like Jason said on the mock-ups you yeah. would be able to move it along pretty quick and then be able to have them give a lot of feedback as well. Yep. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. What about like um, links? I mean, I know things shift so much on the internet. Um, for resources for teachers, if I put links to like YouTube videos or links to companies that I know sell that technology, I mean, would that be helpful for instructors? Yes, most definitely. Uh, okay. I, you know, that having those links would be good. Um, and you know, any instructor know, worth of salt knows that you know links can change sometimes, so it might not be there. But at least you know, initially having those links could uh, could be beneficial. Yeah, I know in our MOOC, every time there's a link checker, and every time I check, we have at least uh, 17, 18 broken links. In yeah. <laughs> it's gonna happen, but I mean, yeah. it's 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 part of you know getting a lesson from the internet, but it's also helpful for it as an instructor to have those uh, possibly when they open up that lesson. Yeah. So I'm just going to add some countering uh, feedback, or maybe not countering, but different mindset. Um, <laughs> my background's actually in agriculture before I switched to instructional design. And oh. so are you planning on your learners having farming backgrounds? Is that what you were saying? Or just using farm as a topic? Yeah, I was uh, kind of assuming that maybe they would have some background in farming already. Because... To me, you say drones, and my first thought is 
make this a math lesson from an ag perspective because the people with a farming background are immediately their first thoughts going to be cost right cost efficiency are they saving money anything like that um more so than whether they can use it or not or how they could apply it because it doesn't matter if they can't buy it so um just from like a similar background <laughs> to a farmer's perspective that i think it what you're saying is great conceptually but your learners, if they are farming backgrounds, are immediately just going to start thinking about cost and whether they can afford it or not. And if they, they might not be able to get out of that real world, like, oh, I can't afford this, so I'm just not going to participate in like, whether I could use a drone or not for this application, because I could never buy it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was hoping is actually being able to do something where they're pulling technical information from a text that would have that and then you know but as far as like going to the affordability part I hadn't really just dis decided on you know I guess you make a budget <laughs> and it gets really really complicated um, another thing too was coming up with the scenario so it was a scenario um, it's a family farm they're short on they're short on people or it's a cooperative farm and um, there's issues right. of water or something where drones can really help with that um, Can I just ask who your persona, like which persona you selected for this? The the GF the one? Yeah. So yeah. like here, yeah, it talks about like um, yeah, his yeah. brothers have left the country and everything. So like that's, right. that's really where the start of your scenario yeah. comes from. And it does really lock on to the, he's able to plan the budget. Yeah. And while I'm, I'm in Eastern Washington right now, mm -hmm. so um, I was uh, born in Wenatchee and, you know, farm here <laughs> so um yeah but i i think that that's i think that's absolutely true like um having to have that as a component or it won't seem realistic um the cost has got to be a huge factor so it's got to be like a problem and then is this a realistic solution to that problem and then is it affordable and you know those are i'm hoping that that there can be some kind of a scaffolding document where there's questions and that they go to the text and they find the information and they plug it in and then they come up with a solution as a yay or nay, you know, maybe not definite let's purchase or definite let's not, but something like, well, this might be realistic or, you know, well, we have to get a bank loan or, and that it wouldn't be graded on the rubric wouldn't be uh, whether or not um, or what their outcome is. It would just be how well did they actually go through the process? You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if yeah. they might decide yes or they might decide no, but that wouldn't be the determinant of whether they did well. It would just be, is the information plugged in? And is, um, on a, Brittany, on the math that you were thinking of, were you thinking of, like, how much space could be covered by a drone versus someone driving out? I mean, I came from driving a ranching, so we had to drive out and look at cows. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of agriculture background yeah. in this group. <laughs> We're not there anymore. Yeah. We don't want to be in agriculture anymore. How about that? <laughs> the amount of space that uh, could be covered by a drone or looking for a specific, I don't know, all the apple trees and stuff out in Washington and the valley and everything. Like something that has to be monitored, how much more space could be monitored by a drone versus some versus actual people going out there to look at it is another kind of math. I don't know what the math problem is going to be for you, but I mean, like you could think of that kind of structure perhaps. I mean, that would be very realistic. Yeah. I'm just need to keep working. <laughs> it, you, it's, it sounds like you have a pretty good structure going on. It's just a matter of some tweaking some of the yeah. details. I think you have some yeah. good, a good framework set up. It's just a matter of thinking through some of the uh, details to it. Uh, yes, uh, this is John. Um, just uh, had a quick comment there. I'm not sure, are, are you folks familiar with the, uh, the 4CID by Marion Burr, your own uh, Marion Burr? Oh, it's a long the, time ago, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll send a link in there, and um, the, here's, a, here's a nice link. It's a, it's a little bit, uh, probably a bit, a little more complicated. There's simpler versions, but it links to other places, and uh, it's a nice approach for thinking, and again, we're talking about, I think, a, a problem 
uh, uh, yeah, a, a problem-oriented approach, right? Mm -hmm. It's task or problem-oriented. Mm -hmm. You really want it, as uh, Jason said before, authentic and hands-on as possible. But um, in this case, with the um, with a drone, it'd probably be more pro a problem orientation. And what he does basically, he uh, divides up the, um, uh, if you will, the, uh, the the lesson right into the uh, the. It starts with the key uh, uh, problem or task, and then there may there are associated tasks as. Um, Kay was talking about the, the affordability, perhaps, and you lay out the whole um, the whole lesson, if you will, right? Uh, the whole uh, the main task at hand. What is the problem, if you will? What are the the ancillary problems, the the, the associated tasks? And then uh, along with that, there are support materials. Is there a quiz or something to do with that? But uh, narrowing down the task is the first thing. What are the associated tasks with it? Then there's the support materials, the scaffolding, if you will, to um, these may be handouts, maybe, uh, I was going to say job aids, but different kinds of aids and so forth. And um, then there's the, the just-in-time teaching. So if this is done uh, as a tutorial or with someone else, right, then there, if there's an instructor there, then it would be the, uh, filling in the, the other pieces and giving that help just in time. Uh, so that that kind of outlines it, and I just find that a pretty pretty helpful model to get the big picture and get all the the uh, the larger uh, elements of what you're going to be delivering as a um, as a learning lesson, basically. So so Jason, to tie in uh, what what John was saying and uh, what we're talking about having the links. Would that, and you were talking about the hybrid. Would that be appropriate for the learners that you're we're trying to put in that hybrid category where they have the, the kind of less than in face to face, but maybe they would spend their time outside the class digging into those links or, or watching the videos. Is that kind of the offloading some of that? Yeah, exactly. like some of the, um, offloading some of that direct instruction could possibly be done. Uh, if you could utilize videos or pre uh, pre readings, that way they can come into class and focus on you know the instructional problem at hand. Cool. This is great. This is good. <laughs> this is like design. We're actually designing instruction. Yeah. <laughs> so I do have to warn you. I have like five more minutes. Dad yep. just got home and I have identical twin three-year-olds. <laughs> you got to go. So. And we normally try to keep it to an hour. This has been awesome. Um, and I think the last, uh, and John or Jason, if you do need any, if anybody actually needs to, to run out, but I did want to make sure, um, I think Mary was on, has been on, if you had any questions for the, for the group. All we see is a wall, I think. <laughs> Just as uh, still working on catching up with the modules, so sitting on the webinar, more to listen from others. All right. Well, I think then we're good. I think we, if we, if we, on through everybody. And Jason, thank you so much. You are amazing for what oh, you do no, and you. for joining us. And you, you worked with Willie, right? Um, I did. I uh, yeah. Willie was one of my professors at Arizona State. Who's amazing. So yes. she's amazing by connection. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. This was a great discussion, and we'll basically do the exact same thing come the seventeenth. And if you have any other questions, just post them in the course, and hopefully we'll yeah. get some materials one, for Jason. One really quick question, sure. Jason, and you don't have to elaborate. You can say yes or no. Um, do you design? Do y'all design like? Do you use Bloom's taxonomy or anything specific, or is it just? Do you have any specific model that you design by? Um, that I design by. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't necessarily design a whole lot of individual lessons. I uh, look at more like educational educational technology frameworks in regards to working with working with staff. Uh, so I look at SAMR and TPAC are the models I, util I utilize for teachers in order to help them understand um, tech integration. As far as um, um, teachers, because you know uh, the teachers will, you know, most of them are K-12 prof uh, professionals who use, uh, who teach adult education on the side. Uh, they'll be mostly, should all be well-versed in Blooms and then in some case, um, uh, depth of knowledge. Okay, thank you. Yep. You guys are awesome, this was fun. I could do this all the time. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you everybody. Have Bye. a great night everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.